I'm Ann Outlaw from the Center on Knowledge Translation for Employment Research, or the Cater Center, which is housed at the American Institutes for Research, or AIR. The Cater Center is funded by the National Institute on Disability, Independent Living, and Rehabilitation Research, or NIDLER. I want to thank Joanne Starks, Rebecca Gaines, and all my colleagues at the Cater Center for their support for today's webcast. Before we begin, I'd like to go through some of the Adobe Connect logistics. You should be listening to this presentation through your computer speakers. So if you need to turn the volume up, you can do so on your own computer in your audio settings. If you have any questions or comments throughout the presentation, please feel free to type them into the chat box on the left side of the screen, and we'll bring these to the attention of our speaker. Cart captioning is available for this webcast, and the link is in the pod on the right side of the screen labeled Webcast Links. Rebecca, would you go ahead and put the cart link in the chat box, please? Yes, ma'am. Thank you. Also in this pod are links to the presentation webpage and Rebecca's email address if you have any technical problems. So you, please feel free to email her at rgaines at AIR.org. This webcast is designed to respond to the technical assistance needs of NIDLER grantees, particularly those in the area of employment research. Measurement and assessment are always topic areas where grantees indicate they would appreciate support. So today's webcast presentation will describe the development of a newly created tool to help individuals interested in knowledge translation, such as researchers, knowledge brokers, and others to assess research for its potential for translation, dissemination, and utilization. The purpose of this end of grant readiness tool is to help you determine how ready your, re your knowledge might be and the corresponding KT activities that may be relevant. This tool, along with the presentation materials, are available for download on the bottom right side of your screen. Please keep in mind that this tool is still under development and you must correspond with the developer before sharing it or the other presentation materials. Um, and now I would like to introduce today's speaker. Dr. Travis Steiner, who is a knowledge broker, content specialist at Gambling Research Exchange Ontario, or GRIO. GRIO is a ministry-funded organization with a knowledge translation mandate. Travis received his PhD in psychology from Carleton University, where he developed a keen interest in knowledge translation. He developed and taught a graduate course on the subject and also published a guide for re researchers. We are happy that Travis and Grio have agreed to share this information with our Nidler grantees and others. So let's get started. Travis? Hi, everyone. I hope you can hear me. Thank you for joining me. Um, I see there's 18 people joining us right now and uh, a lot of you from Canada, so hello to my uh, fellow Canadians. Um, so, let's just begin here. So I'm from Gambling Research Exchange Ontario. So we're a ministry-funded organization with a mandate to do knowledge translation exchange and gambling research. And my interest, as mentioned, in knowledge translation really started as a, um, during my PhD and my postdoc. And I did both of those at Carleton University. And so to understand sort of where this readiness tool came from, you have to sort of understand the background and sort of how it was developed. So first I'm going to take you through that, a little bit of background, a little bit about why I developed it and sort of where it sits in terms of my mind's eye. And then uh, we'll get into um, sort of its development and where it's at currently. Okay, so a little bit of background first. So <clears throat> it started in, at uh, Carleton University, then my postdoc. And so, you know, during my PhD and in my postdoc, I started thinking about my research and its implications for um, practice. Um, I had done a series of studies for my PhD, um, and I thought, you know, it's, it's a shame that what I do isn't going to be used. And so I started to hear about this thing called KTE, and it could break silos and, and sort of get you out of the ivory tower and sort of, uh, uh, you know, release you from what I call the academic womb, which is nice and warm and fuzzy and, uh, and, and comforting, 
but I really wanted to expand my research findings. And the question became, what can and should I do with my research? I've done these studies for my PhD. I've continued it on to my postdoc. Uh, there's a bunch of information that's there, or a bunch of knowledge that I've acquired, but what can I do with it? What should I be doing with it? And that's where this really stemmed from. So I, I, needed, I needed some clarity. As a researcher, I love, I love clarity. I love uh, steps and processes. Uh, the problem is KTE, from what I understood, was very muddy, and, and you have to get your hands dirty. And, and what I really needed was, was something to tell me what to do, what should I be doing. So I started my search for clarity. I started where everybody else starts, usually uh, the knowledge to action cycle. And I thought, this is great. You know, it has all these different steps, evaluate outcomes, sustain knowledge use, identify problems. But the more I got looking at it, uh, the more I was confused about, you know, where, where do I start? In what order do I do it? There's all these interlocking, inter sort of uh, linking sort of um, um, steps. I wasn't sure uh, at what point I should be doing. Do I need to do them all? Um, I looked at the uh, KT planning template. Again, really great um, and sort of laid out in a, in, a, in a logical order. But again, it wasn't quite clear about what I should be doing with my research. Um, so, um, and I looked at the Leeds brokering model and other models as well. I, I basically did a, a search of, of, of all the available models. And there seems to be a plethora of these frameworks and models and templates available, some based on sort of an integrated approach, some focusing on end of grant KTE. And what I did is I summarized the findings for my field uh, down here. You can see a copy of the, uh, the article I, I wrote out. It was a Knowledge Translation Exchange and Gambling Research, a Beginner's Guide, just basically summarizing the main findings um, from, from my searching for my need for clarity. Um, but I found that none of them really answered my question about, you know, where am I and what should I be doing? What I needed was a path through the muddy swamp. And what would really help me out would be some sort of flow chart, something with a start and a finish. And so I was part of this uh, Carleton University Great Hub, which was a knowledge translation hub funded by the, the agency I currently work for. And so I did what any researcher would do, and uh, I made my own. So uh, frameworks and, and flow charts, especially ones in knowledge translation, uh, I'm going to steal this joke, are sort of like uh, a, a, a toothbrush. Everybody has their own, and nobody wants to use anyone else's. Uh, so I, 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 I succumb to that. And uh, this whole flow chart is available. You can download it in the uh, presentation materials. And it's also available on my website, which I'll show you in a second. But basically what I did is I mapped out, if you start in the top left here, uh, it's the start. And then right here's the finish. And basically, I mapped, it, I mapped out the knowledge translation process for myself, starting from the knowledge determination phase, where you sort of determine what knowledge you have, to the knowledge planning phase, which is you know planning what you can and should be doing with that knowledge, into the knowledge action phase, which is actually you know implementation, where where where, where you go about and sort of um, do whatever your KTE is, and, and then you finish. And so I you know I made this with little arrows, and the the red arrows mean no, you go back. Start if it, if the answer is no, and then the the other arrows sort of continue on. So I made this flowchart. I thought it was great. Now I have something I can use. I can go off of. I can refer back to. Um, so again, this is available at uh, at my website, or you can download it. And there's an additional companion handout that goes with it. And what the companion handout does, or attempts to do, is in each one of these uh, circles like have you identified a potential problem or issue, it will, the companion handout will go into detail or a little bit more detail about how exactly to do that. Uh, so in essence, the companion handout was a sort of user guide to the, to the flow chart. Um, so I was like, okay, so I, I've created this flow chart. I'm just creating the companion handout. It's time to start filling out this companion handout. So let's start at the beginning. This is the, the, just a zoomed in uh, version of that. So the first was, have you identified a potential problem or issue? In, in my case, for my research, it was that, yes, gamblers oftentimes gamble more money than they should. This is a potential problem or issue that needs solving. We need to stop gamblers from gambling so much beyond their means. So perfect, great. Next one, do I possess the knowledge I want translated? In this case, yes, I do. It was my, it was my, my um, PhD and postdoc thesis. So yes, I definitely want that translated. And then I got to this one, is the knowledge ready to be used? And it says, you know, knowledge should be couched within existing literature, be locally relevant, have a potentially large effect. Um, is it ready to be used? And I, and I started thinking about this, and I, I couldn't determine whether it's ready to be used or not. I mean, the problem is, you ask any researcher, 
any, any real sort of basic researcher if their knowledge is ready to be used. And they will say no. They will, they will list off in detail all the specific limitations of their own research and why nobody should do anything with it without more research being done. And I think that's a typical response from a lot of researchers. I mean, even in my role today, when I go to in my knowledge translation role, when I go to translate other people's knowledge, they're very hesitant to do that at first because as researchers, we're taught not to sort of um, generalize above and beyond what our research says about, you know, um, given its, its population and, and, and other limitations that I won't get into. But, so, okay. So I didn't know whether it's ready to be used. So, not all knowledge is born equal. It exists on this sort of continuum of readiness to use. So even if knowledge exists, it might not be ready to, to be used. So I want to see, is there any sort of systematic way of seeing if this knowledge is ready to be used? So I contacted different KT organizations. I did a lit search. And like Donald Trump's hands, I sort of came up short. There doesn't seem to be any sort of uh, literature out there that, 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 that proposes in a systematic way how to determine if some empirical evidence that you have is ready to be used or not. So again, I did what any other researcher would do. I went ahead and made a tool. Um, and that was really the uh, crux of why this tool was made and how it was made. Um, so uh, <clears throat> I started with uh, an initial draft. I scoured through the literature and I tried to find what are, what are other people saying about this, about how how and when you know, research or empirical evidence should be used. And so uh, the, the book, Knowledge Translation in Healthcare, Moving from Evidence to Practice, has these great quotes that I thought were relevant. Um, when considering end of grant KT activities, it's crucial to consider the strength of the evidence and its significance and tailor our strategies as appropriate. Another quote is, uh, the strength and significance of the research findings should determine the magnitude and extent of the knowledge translation. And finally, decisions about the extent and ambitiousness of KT plans should be guided by the reliability, validity, strength, and significance of research findings. So I thought, those, okay, those are pretty great. That at least gives me some basis to go off of in terms of trying to um, uh, assess my own, my own literature. And what I really found in the literature is there's, there's three sort of overreaching criteria that I could come up with for how you should judge empirical uh, uh, readiness. Uh, the first is that the evidence in hand is kept within a larger body of work and exists within a solid foundation of valid, high-quality theory and research. So this is sort of to help uh, address the cherry-picking and media bias that, that occurs a lot of the time. Um, sometimes you'll see um, an individual study come out. It'll have really interesting research findings. It'll be really neat and catchy. The media will pick up on it. And all of a sudden, you'll see um, you know, a political leaders or other media personnel saying, you know, look, there's this re research out there. Why aren't we doing stuff about it? Why isn't it being used currently? Well, you know, I say, hold on a second. You know, we don't want to place excessive emphasis on results of a single small study or studies with poor methodological quality or ones where the strength of the evidence is low. So, that, so, the, so the evidence, whatever your evidence is, it should be couched within a larger body of literature. Um, Another sort of contention I had uh, when I was making this tool and, and as piloting with different people is that it's important uh, that the knowledge be of high quality, but then you get into the issue of sort of what is knowledge. And um, you get to issues of rigor versus relevance, you know, how rigorous is, is or should the study or methodology, uh, sort of the methodology be compared to its, its relevance to a general population and generalizability. And then even more so, you get into arguments of sort of research versus practice-based evidence. So a great example of this is uh, um, nurses. Nurses uh, in hospitals uh, taking bandages off burn victims used to uh, take the bandages off, uh, rip them off very quickly. And that was practice-based evidence. They thought that, you know, given their expertise with taking off these bandages, off the burn victims, that the way to reduce the suffering, the pain and suffering from uh, their, their, their um, clients, uh, their, um, whatever that word is, their, the people that they're taking care of, the way to minimize the pain and suffering is to do it quick and then get it over with. However, when researchers started looking into this, it collided with the practice-based evidence. So the research shows that, you know, in fact, that uh, the, the brain remembers intensity more than duration. So it will remember intensity 
uh, much better than it will duration. So therefore, it's better to have a longer duration of low pain and take off you know, the bandages slowly off burn victims and cause them lower pain over m more amounts of time than, than high pain. So, you know, anyway, you get into this whole thing about what happens when practice-based evidence and research-based evidence disagree, which one do you choose? And uh, I start getting into these debates with people. All that to say, this tool is now based on uh, research-based evidence. So that's why I call it the empirical-based evidence readiness tool. And, and more so, empirical-based evidence end of grant research tool because it's really based on that type of the research research has been done now what do I do with it uh, one other thing I want to talk on quickly was that some authors do argue that knowledge syntheses like systematic reviews should be considered the base unit of knowledge translation while I don't disagree that um, you know um, systematic efforts to do implementation should be based on systematic reviews. I also think systematic reviews are limiting in the sense that there's a lot of inclusion, exclusion criteria. Oftentimes you're trying to find, a, a, especially meta-analysis, homogeneous groups. Um, and oftentimes the results of meta-analysis and systematic reviews are so narrow that they don't have a, a applications or applicability uh, to a, a wider or general population. So you have to be very careful about that. You know, I don't want to say that, that, that all knowledge translation should be based off knowledge syntheses. I, I, I definitely don't think that's true. So that's just my own personal bias. Uh, another overreaching criteria is that the evidence is relevant or appropriate for the targeted domain of use. So evidence should be considered of major, major significance to the knowledge users themselves and evidence should be locally relevant and adaptable to its targeted domain of use. So what do I mean by that? In my case, uh, you know, in, in my research, I was looking at uh, gamblers in a land-based casino and how to stop them from uh, gambling excessively. That might not have relevance if I'm trying to stop online gamblers from gambling. So it should be applicable to its targeted domain of use. Uh, number three is the evidence will have a significant impact of the knowledge users or systems. So, <laughs> This touches on a whole plethora of information dealing with um, the ethics of knowledge translation. So whenever we don't move a potentially useful uh, piece of information or evidence into action, there are costs associated with that, uh, with not moving it into action. Lives could be saved. And in the, in the, in the case where um, evidence has the real, um, has the implication to um, save lives or, or significantly improve people's uh, well-being or health, uh, there's an ethics to that. And that should be weighted a lot more heavily. So even if the, um, let's say, the, this medical intervention or, 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 or what be it, um, isn't, uh, isn't based on a systematic review, that should weigh a little bit more heavily in terms of uh, the decisions to move forward with it in a KT capacity or not. So that's, that's all I'll say about that. That is uh, sort of point three I leave aside from the uh, toolkit just because, uh, you know, that's, you're getting into a little bit of murky waters there, but I just want you to be aware that there is sort of uh, a lot of ethical arguments both for and against KT, and that was sort of uh, a consideration there. Okay. So let's get on to the tool. The tool basically, as you could probably guess from the previous slides, has two distinct factors. The first is the strength, the quality of evidence, and the second is the significance of the evidence. The tool is divided into two sections, the quality, significance, or the quality and strength, and the significance of evidence. And each section contains some scoring, scoring criteria. The scoring criteria is a number. You just sum up the numbers at the end. Uh, the points, and then that will result in sort of one of three readiness outcomes. Now, I used to have four readiness outcomes um, in this toolkit, uh, but after um, some pilot testing and some um, conceptual um, and disagreements with colleagues, I, I've narrowed it down to three, but we can get into that uh, a little bit towards the end. So again, some caveats just because I need to. So this tool is really designed to be used by, you know, researchers who want to assess their, the KT readiness of their own research or others' research. Uh, it could be used by research funders who want to assess in what capacity KT can be applied to complete their research. Uh, I will say that this KT tool has had interest here at uh, GRIO because we were once a research funding body, and so we have a lot of research that's been done. Now we're a knowledge translation body. Um, you know, the question becomes, what 
of that funded research do we move forward with, and in what capacity, and how do you judge one against another? So, so and that gets to, to my third point. KT organizations should wish to assess completed research to determine what capacity they can move forward with. So great. Uh, the current checklist again deals with empirical evidence from a very much from a health and social science perspective. So you know there are initial considerations you'll see in the toolkit uh, of the strength of evidence that are based on the uh, evidence pyramid. So again, that's very health and social science focused. Um, whereas in your specific field, that might not be the same. So it might need to be, this, this whole tool might need to be slightly adapted to meet the needs of your organization. Um, and again, just before we get into it, it's ugly. This is a blueprint. It's not um, user-friendly right now in any way, shape, or form. It's sort of all plastered on a page. Uh, when the tool is finally designed, it's going to be, you know, have automatic scoring and categories with drop-down menus, et cetera, et cetera. All right, so this is it. I know it's not, uh, not very impressive when you first look at it, and it can be a little bit confusing. But uh, let me take you through it, and, uh, and then we can, we can do some questions, and hopefully you'll be able to provide some feedback to me, because I'm always looking uh, to hear from you and, and your feedback on this tool. All right, so let's start at the, at, the, at the top. So firstly, you have this box called Initial Considerations. And this is based off, uh, this is the empirical basis of the knowledge. So, so how I designed this tool was that um, if you're starting off, with uh, knowledge or uh, empirical evidence that's based off a of meta-analysis, it's initially worth more points than, say, evidence based off an observational study. Now, the tool is designed such that, you know, a meta-analysis can score very low at the end of the tool, whereas an observational study can score very high at the end of the tool, depending on how it does in the next two categories. So this is just an initial weighting of the evidence, and then everything past this sort of determines um, where it will lie on the continuum at the end. Okay. So again, if sorry, let's just go back one second here. Uh, if we look at the points, you'll see the points, uh, the most awarded for the knowledge syntheses, uh, less points for the uh, primary research. And this is based off the uh, evidence pyramid where, you know, systematic reviews and filtered information are sort of at the top of the pyramid where unfiltered information such as the case controlled studies and cohort studies are, are down here. So you should, again, initial considerations are based off this evidence pyramid. Okay. Uh, so that's the first section is the first weighting. And then the, the next section is assessing the quality and the strength of the evidence. Let's go through that. So the first thing to look at is, is the empirical evidence of high quality, methodologically or otherwise? And then I have yes, you can score up to 10 points here, or no, you can, uh, you can lose up to 10 points if it's not a great study. But how does one go about assessing this? And again, just like before when I was doing the flow chart, I got into a little bit of a pickle. I started looking at uh, multiple different, um, there are multiple different tools available to assess the, the methodological quality of evidence. Um, I felt like the, um, a lot of them brought uh, subjectiveness into the, into the measure. Um, I'll give an example. Some methodological quality tools ask things like, uh, did the author consider the appropriate uh, theoretical framework uh, for this study? And that might all be well and good if you're you know, sort of an, er an expert in that area. Uh, but for people just assessing the, your, your study, you know, that, that, that brings a lot of subjectiveness. You know, how do I know in sort of um, in the disability field or, or, or rehabilitation field whether, you know, an author has used an appropriate framework to frame his question? I mean, I, I have no idea of that literature. It would take me years probably of scouring the literature to try to answer that question. So that's all to say <laughs> that GRIO, Gambling Research and Terra, we've made our own tool called the quantitative evidence evaluation tool. So we have the quant EET, and we've also just developed a qualitative EET. If you want a copy of this, uh, just send me an email after. I'd be glad to send it to you. But, but basically what these two tools try to do is take away all that subjectiveness and, and just measure methodological quality based on objective measures that anybody could do, even if they're not expert in that field. And then, and then you get sort of points at the end. So great, so that's done. Um, just looking at time here. Okay, I'm still doing great. Um, 
So the quality and strength of evidence, so this one, basically, however you do it, if you have your own tool that you'd like to do, that's fine too. Just transform it afterwards to plus 10, minus 10, and you score yourself points on that. Uh, the next one is the evidence in line with an existing body of knowledge or catch within an existing literature. These are the yes, which is plus five points, limited or no. And again, these scoring systems, the scoring hasn't been piloted yet. This is just to give you a sense of how much I weight each thing and how much I feel each section should be weighted. Um, what is the estimated effect size of the outcome? This has to do a little bit with, um, okay, both this question, what is the estimated effect size of the outcome, and it has uh, links to compute and thresholds, and what is the sample size, was the sample size adequate to detect the discovered effect size, and then gives you power analysis. Those two questions have to do a lot with the uh, crisis that's happening right now in psychology with p-hacking and replicability studies. So, again, you, you know, with a large enough sample size, you'll find significant findings in anything. Um, but that doesn't t tell you if it's meaningfully significant in terms of the, what is the effect size. So how much of the variance in, in it can be accounted for uh, in, in the DV by the IV. And that's where sort of the effect sizes come in. And so sort of I weight that a little bit more heavily. Uh, and again, with, with, um, with the sample size adequate to discover effect size, this is, has to do with a lot of p-hacking and a lot of, um, I'm not going to call it statistical trickery because, you know, that's uh, not the right, <laughs> right, right, politically correct thing to say. But um, but there are a lot of concerns right now about uh, about p hacking and about power analysis and effect size. So that's why I add those two questions in. And then the next question, the last question is: Is the evidence ecologically valid? And this this has to deal with um, again a lot of criticism in the gambling field specifically of us using um, students in our samples. And the question is: Do real gamblers act? as undergrad students because a lot of, a lot of these, um, the studies that we're doing are not using an ecologically valid sample. But in my case, at least, I was using an ecologically valid um, situation. We had real slot machines that I was running um, participants through in a miniature casino that we made at the lab, so it was very fun. So that is the evidence ecologically valid. So that's the first section. Next section is the significance of evidence. So again, here I say, you know, note you may need to consult with stakeholders or knowledge users to help you answer some of these questions. You might not know them yourself. And some of these questions, like the first one, does the evidence fill a knowledge gap or need? This is really designed to be answered right away, but I mean, if you really want to do a needs assessment, as in, you know, this one, yes, determined via needs assessment, that in itself could take a whole year before you're able to answer this one question of this whole list. So, you know, this, this checklist isn't designed to, uh, you know, or it's not supposed to take you a very long time to do it. It's just supposed to be used to give you, give you a general guideline of, of, of what you can and should be doing with your literature. So if you know, you know, if your evidence fills a knowledge gap or need, then you, you weight yourself. Um, different points. So no, if you know it doesn't fill a knowledge gap or need, you get negative points, you know, because in that case, you know, you might have great literature that's based, uh, that is done very well and has great effect sizes, but it's not filling a gap or need that's wanted by your end users. So, you know, automatically you get, you get uh, subtracted points for that. If it's, if it's, if there's a specific request, then you get 15 points. Um, the next one. Um, can the evidence be applied to the target population? Um, yes, maybe, can be adapted, or no, uh, negative two points is plus five. Does the evidence directly assess the desired change in belief, attitudes, et cetera? Um, and this has to do with a lot of times, especially in psychological research, um, we might be tapping, or we might be asking, uh, I'll give an example from the gaming field, we might be asking about readiness to change. So does this, uh, this program, uh, affects people's willingness to go into treatment. And you might say, wow, look, you know, this, 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 this intervention has a great effect on people's willingness to go into treatment. But, um, but your intervention that you want to design wants to get people into treatment, actually behavior going into treatment. And so if your evidence doesn't directly assess the desired change, then that gets negative five points. But if it does tangentially, like, uh, you know, sort of beliefs to attitudes behavior, then, um, then you just don't give yourself any points. And then the last one is something that I've, uh, I've been sort of uh, uh, dealing with conceptually is does the evidence provide a new novel or innovative way to, to address a desired change? And I give that one five points uh, or, or no points at all. 
And this has to do with, um, again, if there's a new or innovative way to do things, does that mean we should be more willing or less to, to go about doing them? I'm not quite sure. Um, I, don't, I don't assign negative points here. I just give five points if it does address a new or novel way. Um, again, I'm not sure that that bottom criteria should be there. I had a different criteria before that got taken out. This is, tool is constantly in, in development. So. Hey, okay. Travis, we have a question for you before we go on to the slide. So, yeah. um, Andre asks, can you explain what you mean by determined by local opinion for the question, does the evidence fill a KU knowledge gap or need? Yeah, so I'd imagine the local opinion being you meeting with the stakeholders or knowledge users uh, or, or other researchers in the area. In my case, you know, it's, it's, it's uh, local opinion is determined, I think, that, uh, that there is a need to fill or to uh, protect gamblers from gambling too much. That, you know, that's, that's sort of the general consensus of the field. Uh, there's a lo that general local opinion that, um, that this gap needs to be filled and that uh, there's a lot of research being done to try to fill it. Um, but, it, I, uh, you know, it was never done it, with the consultation or formal consultation with, you know, the gamblers themselves. You know, I've never sat down with a group of gamblers and been like, do you need new ways to... Uh, to, to sort of uh, gamble responsibly, and if so, what do those look like, and, and, ha and, how, and how might we address those? And so that's where, you know, determined via needs assessment or formal consultation comes in. And then if yes, determined sp specific request, this would be an organization like maybe um, the, the, your local lottery and gaming corporation coming to you and saying, listen, we need a new way to do this. Can you, can you go in the literature and find us something, or, can, or you know, can you, uh, is, is, is there something that, that specifically addresses our needs? Here in this in this situation, so that that's sort of what I uh, was envisioning for that. And I should say that there will be again a user guide to sort of accompany this as well, where it sort of spells out those um, those types of issues. That has not been completed yet. That is a work in progress. Uh, and that you know the copy of the tool that you have there in the presentation materials doesn't have the user guide with it, but that is going to be coming and, and that will explain in more detail what each of the options mean and what each of the lines mean. Okay. It's just so that, should people, that, um, if they're seeking the guide, should they go to your website or email you directly or either? Yeah, email directly works perfect. Uh, I'll share my email at the end, but it's just travis at griot.ca is, uh, is my work address. And then, um, and then I'll provide my personal just in case anybody wants to get in touch with me outside of the organization for whatever reason. Okay. I think now's a good time to just point out that the uh, anyone can type in their questions in the chat box. So please keep those questions coming. And thank you, Andre, for posing yours. Yeah. Okay. So what happens at the end? So I've gone through this whole checklist. I've got a, I've got a bunch of uh, points. Um, what's the outcome? So the idea is you, you sum the score and you compare the outcome to the outcome table. And the outcome table is sort of split into three categories. Now, I just yesterday um, was looking at the uh, CIHR website, which is the Canadian Institute for Health and Research, CIHR, yeah, um, which is a Canadian uh, organization, government organization that does a lot of knowledge translation. And they uh, basically have these exact same, more or less, three categories in their resources as well. So I'm glad to see that. But how I picture it is low readiness. Um, if you score low, that means more research is needed and passive dissemination, also called diffusion in CIHR language, uh, is appropriate. If you're at a moderate readiness, uh, then more active dissemination, also just called dissemination, is appropriate. And then higher readiness, if you score very high, then uh, implementation, or as they call it, what do they call it? They call it application, uh, is appropriate. So, so those are the three basic categories you can picture uh, it as, um, yeah, as diffusion, dissemination, application, if you want, if you're used to the CIHR um, uh, terminology. It's basically the, the same three I came up with. Okay, so what does that mean? So in the low readiness translate uh, category, so if you score low, the only, the only reason you would score low in this is if one of, the two, one of two things didn't work out. Either you have very poor evidence or you uh, aren't taking your uh, end user, knowledge user needs into consideration. So if you scored low readiness translate, 
I would argue that the evidence is not ready to be translated because of one of those two things. So that, therefore, more high-quality, highly significant research needs to be conducted. So, so you, you either need to conduct higher-quality research or your stakeholders should be consulted to make sure that the results of any future research will be of value so that it, can, so that it has more significance to the end users. But I used to have a category called not ready to translate in which I said basically you can't do anything with your research or this is just so poor of quality and significance to end users that it, nothing should happen. I, I've taken that out. I think that was, that was definitely my bad. And uh, there, uh, many arguments have been put towards me that no, you know, even if even if it's not great research, and even of if it's not of significance to the end user, passive dissemination or diffusion strategies are still appropriate. You know, you still want to get that word out there to other academics presenting at conferences, publishing in academic journals, because if it's worthy to go forward in a journal, that means peers in the field have found it that that it has enough quality in it to sort of move forward. And in that sense, I think that, that, that at least that level of, of, of knowledge translation or knowledge dissemination is always appropriate. So I got rid of the category not ready to translate and I lumped it all together in the lower readiness translate category. So I'll say that. Um, so examples, yeah, presentations at academic conferences, hold focus group with knowledge users, and try to determine what their most pressing or upcoming issues are. So that's sort of the one, one outcome. And, uh, and I'm going to be providing more uh, um, examples uh, in each category, actually from the CHR end of grant knowledge translation plan worksheet, because I think they did a great job of summarizing um, in each category what some of the activities you do might be. Uh, moderate readiness to translate. Again, you're ready for more active approaches to dissemination. So here you want to target uh, audiences other than researchers. Examples might include clinicians, funders, members of the public, policymakers, uh, whatever that be. So active dissemination approaches may include, and here's a quote, uh, tailoring the message in the medium to a specific audience, linking researchers and knowledge users through linkage and exchange mechanisms, such as small workshops, uh, focused on the dissemination of synthesized body of knowledge, um, engaging media, using knowledge brokers, creating networks, communities, creating communities of practice. So again, more active uh, dissemination, really trying to get the word out there. If, if, if this low readiness was passive push, then this moderate readiness is active push with a little bit of pull. Um, and then the high readiness translate, here your evidence oh. might be highly, sorry? Uh, excuse oh. me, Travis, we have one, yep. one question before we move on. Um, Joan asks, I'm not sure if I'm just missing this, but are there cutoff scores that are considered low, moderate, and high? Yeah, I think I have that in the checklist right now, don't I? Well, let me download that. I don't know if I gave you the one with the uh, cutoffs or not. Let me just check it out here real quick. Uh, yeah, I do suggest, so in low I have negative 27 to 0, moderate 0 to 30, and then high 31 to 60. Uh, <clears throat> again, this, this, this sort of checklist is just in development currently, so those scores haven't uh, necessarily been pilot tested properly uh, or validated. Um, those are sort of my initial feelings on where the cutoff should be and they need to be further tested. Uh, one thing I'll say before I get to the end here is that, uh, you know, I'm always looking for people to partner with. Uh, you know, I've been working on this, like I said, since, um, you know, my postdoc and it's just been me. I've been working on it alone in isolation Hard knowledge translation is branching it with other people, so I'd love to work with uh, other people to sort of finish this tool off, really get it out there, because I think um, there are a, a bunch of different organizations that have been asking for something like this, and I think it could be very helpful. But, um, you know, right now, uh, with all my other jobs as a, as a knowledge broker at GRIO, uh, this is sort of sitting a little bit on the back burner. Um, so any help to sort of push it forward would be greatly appreciated. So I'll just put that out there right now. Um, so anyway, sorry. Um, where it was back to readiness outcomes, yeah, high readiness translate. So again, you're only going to score high readiness translate if both of those uh, major categories uh, are, are fulfilled. So if you have high readiness translate, that means that A, your evidence might be highly useful to the, uh, to the stakeholders, and B, also that there's a good, good amount of, or, or, or that whatever you're basing your, um, the, the evidence on is of high methodological quality or, 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 or highly significant quality. So, so 
if, if you're scoring high, I argue that you know here you need to go beyond the regular means of dissemination and consider implementation of this evidence into practice, also called ap application. Um, so you need to decide you know what you, what you want to do. You need to be using this knowledge to promote change in attitudes, behaviors, influence decision making. Whatever you want to do, an example might be, you know, starting with a small-scale pilot project in the local community, targeting a population in a local setting, uh, and, and, and testing to make sure that whatever the knowledge, because, you know, one thing that this knowledge checklist doesn't do is tell you how to do the knowledge into action. So, you know, at, at the same time that you, that you should be starting to, um, if you, if you have high readiness to translate, you should be trying to get it into action. It doesn't tell you how to do that. I leave that decision up to you or there's other tools and planning templates that can help you determine exactly what you should be doing. I know there's talks of um, 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 checklists coming out that uh, match target audiences to uh, KT strategies, so you might want to look at those types of things. But um, that's all to say that that um, if you score the high readiness to translate uh, category, then a little bit more than passive, then, then active dissemination is warranted. Okay, so what do I need to do with this still? Uh, I know it's getting on there, so I'm going to try to leave some time for questions here. I still need to pilot test and peer review the scoring criteria. And again, if you want to be part of that, please let me know. Uh, I need to complete the glossary user guide that I said I was going to do and beautify it, make it UX. It's really ugly, just sort of plastered on a page right now. The, the full thing will have drop down menus and hyperlinks and take you to different pages. Um, feedback is wanted. It is needed. I've given this presentation before. I've got some very useful and very valuable feedback off of those. Um, so if you can think, am I missing anything in any of the categories? Uh, do you think any of the uh, criteria in any of the categories aren't appropriate, like the innovation one? Um, collaboration, I've already plugged that. And then finally, you know, did, you know, should I should I bring back that not ready to translate category? I mean, that's that's something I've been arguing with myself. Uh, it's just like, is their research just so bad and so unapplicable to to end users that uh, that really it should go in the trash can? I I don't know. And, I, and 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 as a researcher, if you assessed your own research and got that, <laughs> would you be mad at me? So I mean, that's another thing you got to think about too. Is that, you know. Uh, I, I want to sort of make this checklist too so it doesn't go into negative numbers because uh, I feel like if people score, or let's say you score somebody else's research, another researcher's uh, empirical evidence, and they get a negative number and you come back to them and say, you got negative 10 on that. I don't think they're going to take very kindly to that. So, um, you know, we don't want to make uh, enemies here. It's always about making friends with knowledge translation, knowledge brokering. So uh, you have to be cognizant of that as well. Um, okay, what else do we have here? So yeah. So that is it uh, basically for now. I do have an example I can go through with my own research in a bit, but I think I'll stop there for now. Um, there's uh, The website is grio.ca, that's my organization, or you can reach me at travis at grio.ca. Um, I also have uh, my personal website at uh, drsnt.ca. I know that stands pretentious. I made it up before I actually got my PhD, so uh, forgive me on that. Or you can uh, reach me at travis.snt at gmail.com. So uh, I'll stop right there, and uh, please, uh, yeah, I'd love, I'd love to hear some questions, if you have any questions. Or if not, I can uh, take you through an example. Okay, it looks like a, a few people are typing right now, so we'll, we'll leave it open for questions. We'll uh, take a couple minutes right now. So you shared a lot of information with us, Travis, so I, I get that the questions are coming in and the, the checklist looks very thorough. Um, and let's see, Sarah asked, are the first two quality criteria mostly meant for single studies? Systematic reviews would assess quality of, as a part of criteria to include or not include a study. A systematic review would get double points? Yeah, no, a systematic review uh, for the, I mean, there are um, a bunch of evidence tools uh, out there for assessing the quality of systematic reviews. The problem with systematic reviews, at least in, uh, I don't know what field you're in, Sarah, but at least in um, a big problem with it in psychology and the social sciences is uh, you might get a lot of systematic reviews or meta-analysis, but they're not done very well. Uh, they either didn't follow proper protocol according to, um, according to uh, the Cochrane collaboration or uh, they're missing parts. I've seen I've seen a meta-analysis done assuming homogeneous uh, homogeneity using clearly heterogeneous uh, samples. Uh, there is a lot of, there, I'm not going to say there's a lot, but the, 
you, you also need to assess the methodological quality of a systematic review if it's done. Uh, a lot of people I know treat them as the sort of be-all, end-all, and um, you know, you would like to assume that if you're going to do a systematic review, which is a lot of work, that, that the researchers would put a lot of time and effort into, into making sure that their methods for doing the systematic review are right and that their inclusion and exclusion criteria were appropriate. Uh, but uh, I would um, caution against that. Yeah, sorry. Um, okay, okay, I see another question here. How do you determine the scores for each question construct? Also, why did you decide to include negative scores? Um, yeah, so right now, the I determine the scores for each question construct. <laughs> I don't want to say I'm gut feeling, but I mean, I went through the research, I tried to find what was the most relevant or pertinent about assessing readiness, uh, assessing uh, empirical evidence for KTE readiness. The problem was there didn't really seem to be anything out there. I weighted them according to what I felt was appropriate given the research that I did, and I will be providing sort of references and, 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 um, and sources for my material in, an up, in, in the next version. It's not in the checklist right now, and I need to add those, I know. Uh, so that's why I caution against uh, sharing my, my tool in its current form, by the way. But, um, but yeah, that is uh, it's based on, uh, I guess, my own academic in expertise. Um, why did I decide to include negative scores? Well, th this, was, um, this was in order to um, have that flexibility in initial um, scoring. So remember how I talked about how systematic reviews, a lot of people argue that only systematic reviews should be the basis of KT um, research, and I argued that maybe no, like, you know, if you have a really good, say, random controlled uh, trial that has, you know, adequate power and a big effect, you should, and, and, and is very relevant to the end users, you should be moving on that ASAP. Um, so I wanted the ability to, you know, start with systematic reviews high, but then if they're poor quality and, and, and sort of um, poor um, relevance, that they they end up much lower and can so the idea is you could start with an observational study that ends in high readiness you could start with a systematic review that ends in low readiness it all depends and that's why there's negative and positive scores there uh, Sarah McDon okay yeah uh, Melissa okay sorry I know Melissa um, <laughs> yes yeah, Melissa asked yeah. I'll just yeah, read it out here sorry? if you could if you conduct six observational studies that find the same effect, how would you score this? Would you put a six next to the observational studies and complete the checklist for these studies as a whole? Or would you simply say that one of your studies is couched within a larger body of literature? Melissa, great question as always. Um, yeah, I would argue <clears throat> for that it's, it's a little bit hard because, um, you know, for example, in my uh, PhD postdoc, I have four studies, right, basically looking at the same thing in different methods. And so if I was using this checklist, how would I use it for those four studies? Would I score each one of those four studies? Would I just take one study? I would take, personally, I would take the, 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 the sort of the latest uh, study, uh, the one that I really want to base the evidence, or the, the one that I would picture as moving into action the most and use that as the basis for scoring and then just say that it was couched in a larger body of literature. Um, again, that's something I'm going to have to work out more thoroughly in the user guide in terms of telling people how to do that. Um, but yeah, great question. Great. Um, and Debbie's offered a comment. She says, um, I, appreci I especially appreciate the three categories and suggestions related to the level of dissemination for each. I think the three categories are adequate. So speaking to the point of taking out that fourth category that you mentioned yeah. earlier. No, that's great, Debbie. Thank you. And yeah, that, that is something I struggled with. I mean, you know, you should see the previous iterations of this tool. I mean, this is the initial first draft that I would call the sort of beta draft. But before that, I had, you know, previous ones. And uh, I was really working on that. There was some weird uh, criteria that I had in there before that uh, really didn't work. Uh, Initially, I had planned this uh, readiness tool to be able to be used with, you know, non-empirical uh, evidence, but I realized uh, very quickly that I had to narrow the scope of the tool in order for it to be useful. There's just, 
there are too many uh, complications and, and um, uh, different factors that you need to take into account when you uh, are assessing you know, something like practice-based evidence and how much to weight it. So I just <clears throat> decided let's keep it simple. Well, Are there any other so questions? Much. Or do you want me to take you through an example? Um, sure. We have nine minutes left, so let's go through the example. I'll, okay. I'll get that. Why not? <clears throat> All right. So this is the uh, readiness tool example. So, okay. So this was, again, remember that I really designed this tool because I want to know what to do with my own research. So in my PhD and postdoc, it is a series of you know, three studies, it's now four studies, but I basically examined the role of craving and hunger on gambling behavior. And so what I found in study was that hungry gamblers played a lot longer in the face of loss. Gamblers who craved also played a lot longer in the face of loss, but, you know, craving and hunger didn't, exa didn't, like, didn't affect each other. There was no interaction between the two. Uh, and this was done with all sorts of gamblers. Study two, I looked at problem gamblers specifically, so gamblers that are, were at risk of developing gambling problems. And what I found is that, you know, uh, hungry gamblers, again, played longer in the face of loss. Gamblers who craved, I should say who craved, played longer in the face of loss. And that if, you were, if these gamblers were hungry and craving, they played for an especially long time in the face of loss. There's an interaction there. And then study three, I looked at, uh, I, uh, instead of measuring sort of uh, gambling-related craving, I exposed all participants to sort of gambling-related cues to get their craving up. And, uh, and then I had, again, hungry and not hungry gamblers. And those in the hungry condition had significant higher levels of this hormone called ghrelin. And this ghrelin, uh, this ghrelin hormone has been known to be associated with hunger. Uh, and so these ghrelin levels also uh, predicted persistence in the face of loss. So those, 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 um, those gamblers with high ghrelin levels, which is an appetitive hormone uh, play longer uh, in the face of loss. So altogether, these three studies suggest to me that hunger plays an important role in gambling behavior. And of course, an implication of that is that, you know, if, um, do I have this here? Yeah, so there's some evidence, at least in, in my three studies in my PhD, that, that hunger may cause uh, gambling problems or exacerbate gambling behavior. And this was all using actual slot machines and actual play. But the results are relatively Preliminary, you know, studies one and two didn't really uh, conglomerate. Study three added to study two. Um, so what should I be doing? Um, you know, the, the research definitely has easy to implement, low cost implications. You know, just tell tell people to feed themselves before the machine. You know, or take eating breaks during a casino. Uh, you know, another implication, a policy implication, might be to, to sort of regulate cheap or free healthy foods at casinos in order to help people control their gambling behavior. So. So, you know, what, what should I be doing? How far should I be going with this and, and sort of what, 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 what are the outcomes? So, um, so let's, let, let's just go through this checklist again. So what is the empirical uh, basis of the evidence? Well, in, in this, it, it was a randomly controlled trial. So all three of these studies were, were uh, randomly controlled trials where people were, uh, people were assigned to one of two conditions randomly, uh, and hungry or not hungry conditions and some craving, not craving conditions. So, uh, so I get a four for that one, so that's great. Uh, is the empirical evidence high quality? Again, I'm a, uh, you know, you ask any researcher uh, the limitations of their own research, and they're gonna, they're gonna, they're gonna knock it out of the park. Uh, I'm gonna be relatively modest here. I think, uh, obviously, I think that I did uh, my research to the best of my ability, given my sample sizes, and my research findings had moderate effects, uh, which I'll get to in a second. But I give myself plus five here. I don't. You know, I'm not going to give myself a perfect 10 in terms of methodological quality, but it definitely uh, wasn't poor. And again, you know, I had to defend this in front of a thesis committee, so yeah, better made better made sure that it was of high quality. Um, is the evidence in line with the existing literature? Well, limited. I mean, there is some evidence in the in associated fields like alcohol uh, research and, um, and 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 substance abuse that hunger might interact. There's this. A uh, famous thing in uh, Alcoholics Anonymous called HALT, and it describes when people are most likely to relapse, and it's hungry, angry, hungry, angry, lonely, tired. And so hunger, you know, has always sort of colloquially at least been known to be associated with, um, with sort of relapse or intake of addictive substances. Uh, there's also some, some research on this hormone ghrelin that shows that, you know, it might... Um, it might be responsible for urges, for cocaine use, and other substance use. So it is catch within a limited body of literature, but definitely not within a, within, not within a larger body of literature. 
The effect sizes uh, were, were small uh, to medium in mind, so I'm going to give myself a small on that, a zero uh, of my effect sizes. Uh, but the sample sizes were adequate, so I get plus one points there. Um, the evidence is ecologically valid. Uh, again, I had, uh, you know, uh, students, but problem gamblers in this case, that were students, come into a casino type scenario where they played on a essentially real slot machine. So it was very ecologically valid research. Uh, it fills a knowledge gap or need via local opinion. Again, I didn't do any sort of formal consultation. It seems to be the general consensus in the field that there's a need for low cost, easy to implement responsible gambling strategies. But um, I, didn't, I didn't talk to my end users to determine whether this particular one would be useful for them. Uh, can the evidence be applied to the target population? Yes, I think so. Does the evidence directly assess a desired change? Yes, I actually looked at physical behavior. People were gambling on slot machines, and it reduced that gambling behavior, which is what, in the end, I would like to affect or change. And then the, does the evidence provide in a new or novel way? And I think so. Uh, it hasn't been really heard before in the gambling field, at least, just to eat before you go to the casino. So what do I get? I get uh, 34, which would uh, bring me into the moderate readiness to translate. And with this in mind, I have, you know, I have done passive dissemination. I've obviously presented to academic conferences. I'll be publishing a journal article based on my, my, um, my uh, literature. But I've also produced a, a, a sort of plain language pamphlet for it um, you know, that you can see here, Hungry to Gamble, that, has, um, that, uh, that, that we've done that, that has some tips, including eat before play and, 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 and some explanations about what hunger might do to you during play. And, and so this pamphlet might be something that, Considering I got the moderate ready to translate, I might want to give out to my stakeholders. I might want to engage policy people with this and tell them about it, and and you know um, maybe uh, talk to the casino industry, maybe talk to you know the local lottery or the local gaming casino about you know putting this pamphlet in there or encouraging people to eat somehow, some way before they come into food or before they come to the casino. So yeah, that, that that's about it. I just wanted to take you through a quick example of you know what. what you know, what might be done with my research, but hopefully it's helpful and gives you a little bit of sense about how I was picturing using it. Um, I'm glad I didn't get low readiness to translate, uh, but uh, yeah, it's definitely not in a, I would argue that my research definitely isn't in a high uh, readiness to translate. I shouldn't be moving it into action 100%, like I shouldn't be, you know, uh, pilot testing this just yet. I should be engaging with my knowledge users, engaging with my stockholder, stakeholders, telling them about this research, getting the word out there that this could be a thing, maybe trying to drum up some more research funding to do some follow-up studies, uh, maybe engaging with the gamblers themselves, talking about, you know, what strategies they use uh, when they go to the casino. Do, do, do maybe some of them, and I don't know this, but maybe some of them do eat before they go in, similar to how you eat before you go into a shopping mall. Uh, maybe some of them have already found that this is an effective, responsible gaming strategy. I don't know yet, so that, that's something that I should look into. Um, yeah. And I see it's 3.59. Wow. Good timing. <laughs> right on time. Well, thank you very much for sharing that research and the example of the tool in action. So um, before we close off today, I wanted to invite all of you to fill out a brief evaluation form of this presentation. Uh, the, Rebecca, would you please put it into the chat box? Um, mm -hmm. If anyone has any more questions, please feel free to email Travis or to email us at, the cater, at cater at AIR.org, and we'll be sure to get those questions to Travis. Um, and I'd like to extend a big thank you to Dr. Travis Steiner and also to everyone who participated in today's webinar. Um, we also appreciate the support of Nidler to carry out today's webcast and our other center activities. We'll be working on an archive of this presentation, so if you'd like to view it again, um, I'll email all who registered the link to the archive whenever it's available. So without further ado, thank you so much, Travis, and thank you, Rebecca, for your support. And, thank you. I hope um, it was helpful. Definitely. Thank you very much. Thanks. Bye-bye. Bye, guys.